Well, one of the things about summer is bugs. And very few, but I have seen a couple this summer, is the bumblebee. And the bumblebee is not supposed to be able to fly because it's not aerodynamic. It has a big body and little what? Little wings. So it's not supposed to be aerodynamic, it's not supposed to fly. And there's another one that really struggles in flying. And who said that they saw that up near? It was Christine. What bird did you see up near Bonavista that has a hard time flying? The puffins. In fact, he probably flaps his wings 50 times before he gets out of the water. He's flap, 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 and he's in the water. And the puffin, Newfoundland puffin, just like the bubble bee, you get the impression they shouldn't be able to fly. Now, there's a third creature in nature uh, that baffles us sometimes, and we think that God has a little sense of humor, and that is the caterpillar. Now, the caterpillar is very unique in that it has the potential it's going to eventually become a what? A butterfly. But in order to become a butterfly, God does not put wings on the caterpillar. The caterpillar must go through transformation. Yes, before he goes through the transformation to become a butterfly. So God wants it a beautiful butterfly, but he doesn't do it by putting wings on the caterpillar. Wouldn't that look funny to see a caterpillar with wings on? So you get the impression that God loves nature and he enjoys uh, our enjoying nature. And he gets a lot, I'm sure, humor and laughs when he does some things that seem out of the ordinary. And one story in the Bible where he does out of the ordinary is the story of Abraham. And Abraham and his wife, God says, you are going to have a baby. Now, how did Sarah respond when she was told that she was going to have a baby? What did she do? She laughed. Why would she laugh? Because people at 90, women at 90, do not have babies. Now, did Abraham laugh too? Yes, he laughed as well. It was a miracle on God's part to give someone 90 years of age a baby. And that would impress the person who would go through that like it should impress us who read about it to have trust and faith in God. If God is able to do that and he says, is anything too hard from, for the Lord? That's why the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, your faith comes by reading the Bible stories. When you read that God did that for Abraham and Sarah, then you say, he can do that for me too if I have a special need. And often our faith grows out of turbulence, out of struggles, out of difficulties. And we see how God has worked it out and we say, wow, I can see that God worked that out for me. So I, I have faith in God. And that's why studying the Bible is important because it does give us the insight of what God can do. If he can close the mouths of lions, if he can give a baby to someone 90, if he can open the Red Sea, then certainly he can take care of my issue. And that's why it says in Ephesians 3.20, and I'm going to refer to several texts today, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So he is able to do exceedingly, what's the next one? Abundantly above all that I ask or even think. So that's why we hear the phrase that God has a thousand ways to work out things that come to our lives as challenge. He has a way to work them out. He has a way to resolve it that we can't even fathom at this time. And so as we walk with him and we come into the experiences that give us challenges, we need to know, I serve a God who can exceedingly, abundantly, and above all our, I ask or think, work out these things for me. Now, there's one problem we have that we think that God has a challenge about, 
And that is, even though he could do all these things, can he change me? Can he change me? Am I always like the caterpillar? Or is there potential for me to fly like the butterfly? And so that's the theme of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, which is the main source of our thoughts today. It is important to realize that we don't start off our Christian walk as a butterfly. We start off our walk with God as a caterpillar and think that we are totally in that stage. The caterpillar has the potential, but the caterpillar is not the butterfly. And so when you read Romans chapter 5, and we'll start with verse 6, and then go to verse 8 and verse 10, we find four descriptive words about what we're like as caterpillars in our relationship with God and see the sense of what God is talking about here. So in Romans 5, verse 6, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. In that verse, there are two characteristics Two characteristics that mention what we are like as caterpillars in our walk with God. The first says we were without strength. We were without strength. When I visualize without strength, I see someone hanging on a cliff. And their arms, the strength is gone, and so they don't have the, 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 the arms like this. They're like this, just holding on. They're without strength. There's no way they're going to be able to pull themselves up. They don't have that ability. Their, their strength, it's all gone. So the description here in verse 6 is two things. When we were without strength, when we were without strength, and it says that Christ died for, what's the second one? Ungodly. So the first two characteristics of the four is we as caterpillars are without strength. We don't have the ability internally to be able to go forward, we are just hanging there. It says Christ died for the ungodly, so we are ungodly. Ungodly means we are like or unlike God. We are unlike God. So to realize that we are not like God. It says we are ungodly and we have no strength. Well, that's not very encouraging for you and for me and say, toughen it up, make the decision. You can do right. You can live up to that. It says you have no strength. And you are ungodly. Down in verse 8, it has the next. But God demonstrated his love, his own love toward us, in that while we were yet what? Sinners. So first, we have no strength. Then it says we're ungodly. And then it says we're sinners. That's the characteristic of us as spiritual caterpillars. Sinners are those that fall short of God's standards. They're missing the mark. They're not in tune with God. They are out of harmony with God. Verse 10. Verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of the Son. So the fourth characteristic is when, while we were yet what? Enemies. So that doesn't sound like we have a good relationship with God, does it? So when you take a look at us as caterpillars, starting off, we're not like now, we're not like God created us in Genesis, where God created and said everything was how good? Very good. Things would be in harmony. But when the decision was made to turn against God's word, to rebel and listen to the devil, then we came under a different, a different mindset. We are without strength. We are ungodly. We are sinners. We are enemies of God. And we need to realize that. We are not butterflies. Even though we reflect some characteristics uh, of what God is like, we are not in harmony with God. Now, the Bible has several other verses to support that, and I'll just read a couple of them. And they'll bring back memories uh, to you. First is Jeremiah 13, 23. It says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good. 
who are accustomed to do evil. So that lets us know that it is not within us to take the initiative to be back in harmony with God. Genesis 8.21 says, God speaking, Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is what? Is evil from his youth. Our default reflects the devil, not God. We are caterpillars. We are not, we are not yet butterflies. And one more. Romans 8, 7 says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. And this is interesting. Nor indeed can it be. So our natural minds are not subject to the law of God. And our natural minds cannot come in harmony with God. We are out of harmony uh, with him. So it's important for us as we come together in fellowship to realize even though we hear a lot from the Bible about the butterflies in spiritual illustration, we are actually caterpillars. We are actually caterpillars that have the potential to become butterflies, but we are not there yet. And to think that we are is to miss what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are, are without strength, that we are ungodly, that we are sinners, and that we are enemies of God. So if we hear that, and that is where we are, then we say, how do we change from that? How do we get from where we are so that we are ultimately in harmony with God and that we are like the butterflies? The bottom line is anything I do and everything I try is like placing wings on the caterpillar and encouraging it to fly, it just won't happen. And some of us have experienced that. We have heard things in the Bible. We have observed people that are living good, a good life. And we say, oh, I'd like to be like that. And so we make the effort to try without the transformation the, butter, the caterpillar has to go through. We try and we fail. We fall short. It just doesn't happen. Now, the Waldensians in the Middle Ages had had a word or a phrase that describes our condition without God, and that is the total depravity of man or the inability of man to save himself. There are two thoughts today about God's love for us and grace and how that helps us, and it does apply to the story of the caterpillar. Have you heard the phrase, we are saved by grace? And not of yourself, for it is a gift of God. So we're saved by grace. But what you may not know is that there are two understandings of that phrase. The first understanding is that God showers us his, with his grace, with his favor. And with this, I can do better. Is that right? What can you shower on a caterpillar to help it to become a butterfly? You can give it wings, you can throw water on it, you can put sunshine on it, you can give power on it, you can love the butterfly, uh, the, the uh, caterpillar. How does that make it a butterfly? That doesn't. So what if God can, th can put all his grace he wants on that caterpillar, all his love for the caterpillar, it still doesn't become a butterfly until it goes through transformation. And it's important. So the one thought of grace is... God showers his grace on you, and with your effort, using that grace, you can develop and you can become a better person. And if you don't quite make it by the time you die, then you go through a purgatory experience to get you into a better situation. Think about that. What could God to do to the carnal person that would improve, or what could he do to the carnal person that would empower the carnal person to do better? And the question is, it doesn't work that way. You cannot change a leopard, his spots, or the Ethiopian, his skin, and God can give you all of his love, he can give you all of his knowledge, 
He can give all of his grace to you, but that doesn't change you. That is not how it works. The second understanding of grace is the working in you, he works in you to will and do according to his good pleasure with your consent. So God comes to you, and with your consent, you allow him to come in and do the work. It's not that he empowers you, and you have something within yourself that you can initiate, because the natural heart is not in harmony with God. You're an enemy with God. You have no strength. You're ungodly. You're a sinner. You cannot initiate anything from yourself. God's power on you doesn't change that. But if you consent and you allow him to come in, he is the one that changes you. He is the one that impacts what you are and makes the difference. It's not his power with your will. It is your consent, his power in your life. That is totally different. Do you see the difference? One is you doing with God's help which the carnal person cannot do. No, the person who's given a mental consent to the teachings of the Bible still cannot do it. No, the person says, I love Jesus. I love the law. I logically love him. I love the stories. Still cannot do it. It must be God doing it in us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. It talks about working out your own salvation. Oh, there we are. I am to work out my own salvation. But you know what the rest of the verse says? For it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it is very, it's very natural to think, well, if I give them knowledge, they will change. If I give them opportunity, they will change. If I model it, they will change. The only thing that can change the carnal heart, our natural self, is the decision to allow God to work in us. So how do you work out your salvation? By allowing God to take charge of your life. Jude 24 says, Now unto him, Jesus, he is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. He is able to do that, not you yourself. The grit of your will doesn't do it. It is allowing him uh, to do it. So back to Romans chapter 5. The solution to my separation from God and carnal condition is Jesus. He is the solution. So how does he solve it? Well, when I was out without strength, when I was ungodly, when I was a sinner, when I was an enemy of God, it says, God demonstrated his love toward me that while I was yet a sinner, what happened? Christ died for me. So how, did, how does a solution come about? It is Christ dying for me. So the question is, well, what benefit do I have with Christ dying for me? And Romans chapter 5 says there are four benefits that come to you when Christ died for you. The first is found in verse 9. Verse 9. But God demonstrated his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. I didn't get the right verse there. Much more than, 5, 9, that's right. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath to come. Verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath to come. Uh, what's the word there? The first thing that his, the death on the cross of Jesus accomplishes, it says we are justified by his death, right? By his blood. So when he died on the cross, it made it possible for what? My justification, which is declared righteous before God. So if you go back, this follows the Abraham story in which it says, he staggers not at the promise of God through unbelief. 
but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised he would fulfill. And then what does it say right after that? And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted to him for righteousness. It was put to his account. It was not that he accomplished it, but it was declared that he was righteous because he had unwavering trust and faith in God. So we are justified. We are brought back. We are brought back in to Jesus, through Jesus' blood. The first thing that the cross accomplished for us is we are justified by his blood. We are made right. We are made declared righteous before God. The second thing is found in verse 10. In verse 10, it says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death. So according to that verse, what did his death accomplish? It says we are reconciled to God. In order to be reconciled, you have two people that are odds, right? Two people that aren't getting along. And it says, we are now reconciled to God through what Jesus did at the cross. So reconciliation is being brought in harmony again. So not only are we declared righteous, justified through the blood of Jesus, we are reconciled to God through the death of Jesus. Romans 5.9 is the third one. Romans 5.9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, much more than that, we shall be saved from wrath to come. So the third thing that's accomplished by the death of Jesus on the cross is we're saved from wrath by his blood. What kind of wrath? Well, the punishment of sin is what? The wages of sin is? So we're saved from death to come, but aren't we also saved by the wrath of sin? Does sin have its own consequences and penalties when we practice sin? It does. But when we, when we have Jesus in our lives, we are saved not only from the punishment of sin, we're saved from the wrath of sin that would come upon us. So that's the third one. The first was we're justified by his blood, then we're reconciled to God, we're saved from the wrath of, by his blood, and the fourth one is found in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, much more than that, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by what? By his life. So much more than the death, now that he has risen from the, from the grave after dying on the cross, through his death, we are now saved by his life. I can now be victorious over sin an overcomer. His life that is active provides for me, so I can be an overcomer. So there are four things that were accomplished, the benefits from the cross. We are justified, made right with God. We are reconciled in our relationship with God. We're saved from the wrath of sin, and we are now saved by his life. Matthew one twenty one. if you recall, when the angel told Mary, and Joseph rather, she shall bring forth a son and you'll call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. So how can I have a victorious walk? Now that Christ has accomplished that, how does that impact? How can I have a victorious walk with Christ? There are three steps in having a victorious walk with Christ. The first is, I come to the cross every day, and I thank God for what Jesus accomplished for me at the cross and accept the benefits of his death. So I come to the cross every day and realize that through what Jesus did, I can now be made just before God. I can be reconciled to God. I can have freedom from the wrath. I can have then a success and victory in my life. So at the cross, when I come to the cross, there are three steps of how I can have victory in my life. And the first is come to the cross every day because he saved me from the guilt of sin. He saved me from the punishment of sin. 
He has saved me from the wrath of sin, and he's also saved me from the second death. Ultimately, he will save me from the presence of sin. Salvation has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with Jesus. So the first thing I do, I come to the cross and recognize that I am a caterpillar, and I need Jesus to be my solution. The first step in that solution for a victorious step to become a butterfly is to recognize that Jesus is the solution. He is the one. And I need to acknowledge every day that he, first of all, died for me through his blood. I'm justified, reconciled, and have victory in the life. The second step in having victory in your life is the Bible says, let this mind be in you. So let the mind of Jesus be in you. Philippians chapter 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So how do you get that mind of Christ? You have to allow him to put his mind within you. Romans 5, 5 says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So I open up to allow God to come in to work in my life. How do I get the kind of love? What does this verse say? How do I get the kind of love that's God's kind of love? How I get it is it says the Holy Spirit is the one that puts it there. So if I see in my life or I see in your life the love that's God's characteristic, I can give credit to Jesus because the benefits of the cross come through the Holy Spirit into my life. And I don't grit it. I don't have to squeeze it. I don't have to push it. I don't have to will it. It's a gift. The love of God in my heart is a gift. A caterpillar can't become a butterfly by grit and might and will. A caterpillar comes, becomes a butterfly through going through transformation. So to realize, first of all, what Jesus has done for me and acknowledge that. Second, I invite God to place his mind within us. And there is where the struggle comes. Because you have the struggle of the mind of Jesus and the struggle of your natural mind. And they generally don't go together. And you have to constantly be saying, oh, but I want it. Jesus says, I know you want it, but it's not good for you. So are you willing to consent for me to change that? And you say, no, I don't want it. I want myself. He says, well, then I'll let you have your own consequences until you come around again. And you come around and say, no, I don't feel so happy that I did that. And you say, God, I give you the consent. Are you willing for me to place my kind of love in your heart? And you say, yeah, I'm willing now. And remember, every time that you go to that circle, it gets deeper and closer and harder. And so your first resistance may not seem like it has a lot of consequences, but I think there are many stories that say, God, I don't want the Jonah experience, I'll go. If you want the Jonah experience, you keep resisting God because he's out to save you. And remember, often you cannot really address something unless it's exposed to wake you up. And the way that God does that may not be as pleasant as you would like, but he has to wake you up to the reality that you're still a caterpillar. You may be acting like a butterfly, but you're still a caterpillar unless you ask God to come into your life. So to recognize what Jesus did on the cross is a gift to me. Abraham was declared righteous, not because he was righteous, but he was declared righteous even as he exercised his faith in God. I am declared righteous even though I'm still in the path of maturing to be more like God. And there is a fallacy out there that I will become righteous and declared righteous before Jesus comes. I'm declared righteous now. I still need to mature, and I still have to come to a level of faith that God can entrust me with the challenges of end times, yes, but I'm declared righteous as I prepare for that. So I'm sealed. I'm sealed with salvation, 
and he's looking forward to sailing me with the preparation to go through end times. I won't be declared righteous at that time because I'm declared righteous now because of my exercise of faith. So how important it is that God, and listen to this, that I permit God and consent for God to take me into challenges and trials because it's in those challenges and trials that I exercise my faith and I give him the right because I'll be true to him. I give him the right to then intervene and to exercise his intervention to perform a miracle to find that way because he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. If I choose my own way, then I've lost my opportunity to see how God will work it out. So how important for us to allow God. So I have a saying with myself, God, please be gentle. Please be gentle. Life has its challenges, but please be gentle. I don't want it any tougher. But he's promised there's no temptation or test that's come to you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not permit you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. So whatever circumstance develops, say, okay, God, this is a tough one. I'm struggling, but you have promised that your presence, your strength will be proportioned to my trial. So I accept that. So I never feel that I am overwhelmed. But sometimes you feel shaken up pretty bad. And you say, God, my whole system's reacting to this. And God says, let me calm you down, calm you down, because it's so easy. And it, it is in, in life, it, the two natures, you never lose being having been a caterpillar. And the, the fault that the human person is, is always that caterpillar. And God coming into your life brings his characteristics and subdues that caterpillar so that you actually are reflecting Jesus. But I could tell you, and you probably can testify yourself, that if you yield to temptation, that you quickly can become a caterpillar overnight. You're back to your caterpillar, what you used to be. And so it's subdued by the Holy Spirit. That's why we need every day to come to the cross in gratitude, every day a consent, uh, welcoming the Holy Spirit to come into our lives so that the mind of Christ becomes ours. And putting on the mind of Christ is putting on his thoughts, his feelings, and his motives. A few other texts on that. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. How much? How much is that? Sometimes we tend to think, well, there's a lot I can do. He says, without me, though, it'll be nothing. We need to recognize in that verse that our strength, our strength and ability in our walk with God, God says, if you abide in me as a branch abides in the vine. And if you think about that, one Adventist preacher says, the most natural thing for an apple tree to do is to produce apples. So if the branch is, is, is in the connection with the vine, it, it's not the branch. The branch holds the apples but doesn't produce the apples. It is the life-giving sap that goes through the vine into the branch. And so we could see that I don't have to check off that I love today or that I did this. No. You live in freedom because the presence of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 says the fruit, the benefits that will be seen by the Holy Spirit in your life are the fruits. And Jesus said in, in uh, John chapter 3 when talking to Nicodemus, it's like the wind. You can see the effect of the wind, but you can't see the wind, and so is the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't met someone for a while, and they've changed from being a non-Christian to a Christian, you can say, you've changed. They say, really? Yeah, I can tell something's changed. You're different. He said, I didn't know that. Yeah, but I, have, I do sense that, and they may mention what I no longer love to do, or now I love to do, because the mind of Christ is becoming your mind. And this is John 15, verse 7. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done to you. 1 John 4, 5, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So how do I abide in God? If I confess that Jesus is the Son of God. So if I confess my love for Jesus, I love to be him, for him to be the Lord of my life. It says, God will abide in me and I will be in God. And so it's opening to allow God to come in do what he wants to do. So three steps in victory in your life. The first is you come to, cross, to the cross and thank Jesus for what he has accomplished there for you. You now are justified before him. You are declared righteous before him. You have his life living in your life and that he's taken care of. He's reconciled you to God. He's taken care of your you're a sin problem. He lives a victorious life in your life. The third, second step is allow the mind of Christ to become your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The third and final step is you invite the Holy Spirit to control your life today. John 3, 7 and 8 says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from, where it's going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. The way he works is like the wind, with your consent. In Galatians 5.22, it talks, the evidence of the Spirit in your life is in the fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such as no law. The greatest evidence that you are a Christian is your character your changed life and that change comes about by your consent and allowing God that's why I feel that we should relax uh, in our walks with God because uh, it mentions in Jude 24 and 25 it says unto him who is able to keep you fall from falling and to present you so not only is Jesus able to keep you from falling back into sinful ways, but he's also responsible to present you faultless. How does he do that? In John chapter 6, uh, John 16, I believe it's verse 8, it says, The Holy Spirit, when he comes, he convicts you. He's the one that speaks to your conscience of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. So how do I know if I am right with God? What is the Holy Spirit convicting you of? What is he revealing to you? And if you are responding to what the Holy Spirit is bringing to your attention, you can feel that you're on track where you should be because it's God's responsibility to bring to your attention what needs to be brought. It's also his responsibility to give you a conviction of where he wants you to be. And if you consent to that, he's going to take you there. So you're on track. And so you can relax and say, okay, anything else? Yes, you need to place yourself, and I need to place myself in those places where the Holy Spirit can speak to me. So I need personal devotion in the Bible. I need to reflect on God. I need to come to fellowship. We need to give God opportunities to speak to us, and it's in these moments. And so there are people that may raise standards you have to become this, you have to do this. You can say, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit doesn't convict me of that. I'll listen to what you're saying, I'll evaluate, I'll take look, consideration to that, but unless the Holy Spirit convicts me and I'm, I'm looking at the Bible that he's inspired, um, I can then relax and I know God knows my future. He knows where he wants me to get ultimately. So the experience he's taking me through and you through is in the big picture of our getting ready for his coming. And it all should be in the relaxation of we are allowing the mind of Christ, the benefit of the Holy Spirit, to be in our lives. Now, the biggest challenge to you and me is if we're hypocrite. We have the knowledge. We have allowed Christ in, but not in every room. And if we have kept him out of a room and then we practice, look at, say 
things that we know please our caterpillar nature. And remember, um, Moses said, um, there's a passing pleasure in sin. So if we're hanging on to something that the Holy Spirit is convicting us of, then we will, oh, we will find that we don't have the contentment and the Holy Spirit is agitating us and it's like an alarm clock. And it's, uh, that's why it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quell the Holy Spirit because you can sin against Jesus and you can find forgiveness. But if you sin against the Holy Spirit, a point may come when his voice is silent. So how important for us to recognize this? And you know that the uh, phone always rings when the Lord wants to do something. Hebrews 11, verse 5. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So unless I have the kind of faith like Abraham, and how do I gain that kind of faith? Well, there are basically two options in life. One is to live like a caterpillar. And living like a caterpillar, you are basically saying, I believe the devil has the best way. I believe the devil loves me. I believe that he will provide for me and watch over me, and I will have a satisfying life. That's one choice, and that's a choice that many want. Leave me alone, God. I believe I want that way of life. And that's your choice. The wages of sin is death, and you'll die for your sin. So that's your option. The other choice is, okay, if you want happiness, it's based on the fact that you do not believe the devil has the best way of life, that you believe that God has the best way of life, that he really loves you, and you will trust him. Now, the Bible declares the devil's a liar, and those of us who want to prove the caterpillar life, we will find he's a liar. Those who want to accept God's testimony and say, I sense I am active, I have some pleasure, but I don't have full happiness in my life. I don't have the content in my life I want. God, I believe I want to give you a chance. I'm willing for you to change me and to make me all that you want to be. If you then make that choice, then God will take care of your death penalty, and so you're free. He will infill your life so that you will have the fruits of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the confidence that when he returns, that you will have eternal life. We attended the funeral yesterday, right? A man that loved a good life, but his voice is silent now. And guess what? Where he was yesterday, you and I will be someday, unless Jesus comes back before. So how important for us to say, wait a minute, it's important for me to recognize that even X number of years here, it's going to be an end unless I take care of that death ticket. I can promise to do good. I can will to do good. I can express how I love the testimony I read about Jesus. And Jesus simply says, if you love it, won't you give your life to me? Won't you allow me to take care of your death penalty? Won't you allow me to give the benefits of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you? To give you the happiness that you really want on the inside. So today, it's an encouragement for you to look at the big question. Do I want to stay a caterpillar or do I want to fly and soar as a butterfly? God is not going to put wings on you to take you away. He says the only way is to be transformed. That's why it says in Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but by be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So after saying all that, it's an opportunity for us to reflect where we are. Am I willing to make the effort to place myself in the moments, the places where God can do something in my life? That's my part. Am I willing to give him the opportunity? Is there someone here today who wants to say, I'm tired of trying to put wings on my own life like a caterpillar. I really want the Holy Spirit to have more of his way in my life 
and to move me from a caterpillar to becoming a butterfly. You know, sometimes <clears throat> we may have thought in the past, if I have a correct knowledge, that makes me a butterfly. Or if I attend services, that makes me a butterfly. No. It's more than hid knowledge. It says the devils believe in a tremble, right? It, it, it is walking through the door that God wants us to walk through. We must recognize that Jesus is our only salvation. There's nothing I can initiate from myself. Even with all the blessings of God, that does not do it on the caterpillar. I need the outside intervention of the death of Jesus, the benefits of the cross, the declaration that I'm righteousness from, from what he has accomplished, and then consenting to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. But I have a responsibility, and that is to give God opportunity. I can choose whether I have personal devotion or family devotion. I can choose whether I'll be where the word's going to be spoken. That is my part. I can choose to have meditation time. I can choose to feed on what the devil has to throw. So I do have choice. And by beholding, you do become changed. In my over, my over 60 years walking as a Christian, uh, I've blown it sometimes. I know the times that I allowed myself to be a caterpillar. But I know that any time that I have chosen that, um, the consequences have not been what I want them to be. And I come around and say, they were not really satisfying. I want to have the freedom, the contentment, uh, the sense of peace, uh, sense of certain confidence in God that whatever unfolds my life, I trust him. And he has never let me down. And I'm just so grateful. And I think that, like me, some of you can look back, and there were moments that I sensed, God, you intervened here. If you had not intervened, it would have been a different outcome. And I can tell that you intervene. Uh, and those stories may just be private between you and God. You say, God, uh, I was about to make a choice. And I know that you brought about a telephone call or somebody coming or something happened. All, I think all of us probably, hey, God, thank you. Because the outcome could have been much different. And there may be someone today that's, that's struggling here. Um, someone says, you know, I need to realize that uh, I'm still holding a few rooms in my root house uh, closed to the Holy Spirit having his way. And it's not whether or not I like it or not. Uh, like I said before, how many times do you have to say you hate ice cream to hate it? You can't. So we love our sins, right? But if I come to the realization that Jesus doesn't like that practice that I have, he doesn't like what I'm doing there. Okay, Jesus, even though I love it, because I know that you don't love it, and I know you say that it's wrong because I'm taking advantage of the situation, I consent to allow you to give me a love for the right way and a hatred for sin. That's not me doing it. It's allowing him to do it. He comes in, and like it says in, in Romans 5, 5, the love of God is placed in my heart by the Holy Spirit. The hatred for sin is also placed there. So if you love sin, hey, welcome. That's natural. You don't have to be big. You don't have to be famous to love sin. But you need to be big enough to just consent to God and say, I trust you, and I trust my walk with you. I trust my life with you to allow you to have your way. And that's going to take you out of sync with most of the people that are around you at the workplace, in the family maybe. They don't understand. I mean, you're just a little queer, a little odd. You remember even Jesus' family, they came and they said, he is beside himself. We need to go and rescue him. And here's a man in his 30s. He's beside himself. So they come, mother and the brothers, to take care of him. And Jesus turns and says, these are my mothers and my brothers, the ones that are following. How many would like to have that walk with God where you are a beautiful butterfly? Loving Father, you know our hearts. You know our struggles. You know where Satan pushes the buttons and we yield. The first step is to recognize the conviction of sin. 
Yes, we may love it. That's our natural caterpillar self. But if Jesus says it's not something good for us and we're convicted of that, something that's not Christ-like, are we willing? Help us, Lord. May You won't take that out of our hands. But may we say, Lord, even though I love it, because I know it doesn't make you happy, I'm consenting to allow you to have your way. And while we're heads are bowed and it's between you and God and my eyes are closed too, how many would want to raise a hand and say, God, help me to move completely from being a caterpillar to a butterfly. Would you raise your hand before God and say, God, I want that help. Amen. He sees your hands. Lord, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for each precious soul here Jesus died for on the cross. It's so easy for us to slip back to our, butter, our caterpillar self, but we need, Lord, to recognize we need your presence in our life. We need you to guide us and to make us all you want us to be. You're looking for a people that have completely committed to becoming butterflies. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us this insight. We thank you that you have taken us through the, the many, many um, untruths that are around us. Uh, we can't do it ourselves. We need you. May, this, may we each be faithful. May we each take time every day it's more than hid knowledge. It's a contact as a branch to the vine. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you in gratitude today. In Jesus' name, amen.